Hello and welcome to another episode of The Third Wheel. I'm one of your hosts, Hamish. And I'm your other host, Aaron. And today we're joined by a call out from Sonali's episode, Anu. Yeah, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us a bit about yourself? Sure. Hi everyone, my name is Anu. I went to Warwick just like Aaron and Hamish. I now teach secondary English at an inner city school in Birmingham. And yeah, I lived with Sonali in final year. Uh, we've known each other like all through uni and I guess that's why she asked me to come on and speak. Yeah, yeah. Well, you answered my first question, which was like, how how did you meet Sonali? Well, you, no, actually, well, you didn't actually answer that, I guess. More like, <laughs> I have more a funny story that. about that. So me and Sonali, well, when I got to Warwick, I really wanted to like meet kind of more people from like diverse backgrounds. And there was a lot of social stuff going on in first year. So there was like this Indian society like meet other people and hang out with them thing so I showed up to that and I couldn't really find like anybody to talk to it was really awkward like it was at temple I want to say temple bar or one of those in the student union in the student union like when you go in terrace terrace bar terrace bar temple what am I saying (laughs) I'm like oh yeah it's Indian so it must be temple bar no (laughs) terrace bar they had this meet and greet and it was so awkward and then this girl walked up to me and she was like hey I'm Sonali and she just had this like corporate spiel about how she introduced herself I was like wow she's really she's this is a friendly girl and then I was like yeah I'm not really feeling this meet and greet thing and she said oh there's a Bhangra workshop in half an hour do you want to do it with me and I was like, yeah, okay, why not? What have I got to lose? Never done Bhangra in my life, but might as well. So we went to the Bhangra workshop and I thought the guy who was running it was cute. Oh, he was beautiful. He was like tall and, you know, talented. And I was like, right, great. So I'm going to stay for this dude. And then that's how I started like hanging out with Sonali because we go to Bhangra classes all the time. What year did you start uni? Yeah. Uh, 2014. Okay, it can't be then who we think it was. <laughs> Because I was going to say, if it was any year after, you might have had it on the podcast. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> that would have been embarrassing. But no, you're safe. You're safe. I thought you were going to say when you said you wasn't feeling it, I thought you were talking about Sonali. I was oh, like, right. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was, it was just like, because you realize like when you go to Warwick, there's no one way of like being Indian. There was an Indian community from India. Then there's an Indian community from here, maybe from the rest of the world. And the Indians from India kind of knew each other or some of them did from the big cities they had these like meetups before they came here so they had this like equation with each other so when you get there and you're a brand new person you're a bit like oh I don't really know where I fit in that equation and that's why I wasn't feeling it it wasn't like anybody was openly like hostile to me or anything it, it was that situation where everybody knows each other like if you move secondary school and lots of people have their own friendship groups then you kind of show up and it's like oh you're all friends with each other and nobody knows me so I'm just the awkward new person that's what <laughs> that's what I meant well, that makes sense where were you living before uni that's, that's a complicated question, but I'll try and make it as short as possible. So long story short, I was born in India and I grew up in India till I was about 12, 11 or 12. My dad had moved to the UK around the time, like really shortly after I was born. And he's a doctor for the NHS. And at the time, dad was working in Wolverhampton and Wolverhampton had like a really good public school that you can come and give like an exam for. So when I was in year six in India, dad was like, oh, do you want to try for this public school exam? If you get in, you know, it's a great school. You can go here. You can live with me, et cetera, et cetera. So December 2006, I flew over to Wolverhampton for a day, gave the exam, flew back to India the next day, just went to school like nothing had changed because it was competitive to get in. And then I found out that I got in. So in 2007, I started year seven in Wolverhampton. So I did secondary school here for two years, year seven and year eight. And then there was this visa thing where the UK government said, if my mum's not here, then I'm not allowed to live in the UK. And immigration rules change all the time. So this is a weird clause that they were like, nah, you can't stay here. Even though my dad's a British citizen, my dad's an NHS worker. They were like, no, it's not good enough. We need your mum to live here with you as well. Uh, My mum is a civil servant in India. So it's not like she was going to give that up. Uh, overnight. So then I moved back to India. So from year eight to year 10, I was in India. And then <laughs> my dad moved hosp- hospitals again. He moved to Glasgow and he was like, right, new new place. Do you want to try again? And we were like, yeah, why not? We tried it once before. Let's try it again. So we moved, but this time all of us moved. So my mom, yeah. I have a brother, he moved. 
And we all moved to Glasgow. So I did year 11 and year 12 in Glasgow. And then I came to Warwick. I thought I could hear like a bit of a Scottish uh, <laughs> I was, Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, I was sure. How was all that like moving around? Was it quite like unsettling or did you quite enjoy it? Yeah, it's weird. I think there are skills I have from it that I'm grateful for. Like you can put me in a room with anybody and I will, you know, some way or the other, like manage to have a conversation with them because I've just been in so many, I've been in so many situations where I'm the new person. But then again, maybe I feel a little weird about it. Like in a way, I'm kind of envious of people who have lived in the same place for like all their life because they have this like kind of stability and comfort that I don't really have. But on the other hand, yeah, I'd say I'm fairly like extroverted. I can go anywhere. I'm not really kind of worried about moving in that sense. So yeah, it's a bit bit of both. So you lived in Glasgow for two years? Yeah, I lived in Glasgow for two years. And then there's this, well, Laura Harrison talked about it on your podcast. She said there's this rule that if you are not a student in the UK for three years, you don't qualify for home student fees. You have to pay international my parents were not about to pay their international fees money. So they were like, nope, you are going to take a gap year. So I took a gap year. 2013 was my gap year. And then 2014, I started at work. Okay. What did you do in a gap year? A bunch of stuff. So I interned for a refugee charity. That was the year that Scotland had like a referendum and they were wondering whether they were going to leave the UK. So I studied politics at work and I've always been fairly political. So I got involved in the campaign to stay in the UK. I'm not sure how I feel about that now, but... And then I started kind of working for Scottish politicians. I got an internship at Scottish Parliament. And then I also did Italian and Spanish at Glasgow Uni part-time. But sadly, I never kept up with it. So I only did it for like a little bit on the gap year. I really should go back to it. Maybe this is my reminder to take that up again. Well, that's pretty... uh... I don't know. You don't hear many people say they do kind of stuff like that on the gap year. It's normally just like a gap year and just go traveling <laughs> to like Southeast Asia or something. I don't say that game. A gap year. <laughs> <laughs> what? Okay, yeah, Have you not heard that. that before? No. It's, uh, I think, uh, especially, well, that's more, I think, people who are fairly well off and they can, you know. Yeah, okay. Aaron fits that. <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't go on a, I didn't go on a gap year, but I thought you would have liked that term because... You like anything against people with money. <laughs> I mean, I did hear Hamish's uh, episode where he's talking about like the difference between how he grew up and, you know, talking about people at uni who talk about privilege. I thought that was spot on. I've never heard anybody talk about it that well. Thank you. I'm Thank not even you. talking about that. I'm just talking about the amount of times he tells, he like has a go at people with having like four bathrooms or two bathrooms. <laughs> a lot of it is jokingly, but some of it, all, it all stems from truth and all good jokes come from a place of truth. So I make sure to, you know, just correctly deliver on it. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, a lot of it doesn't come out on the podcast because I know a lot of people will start getting offended at us. When I say at us, I mean at specifically me. But yeah, I appreciate that you understood that. Well, a few people actually messaged me that they understood it, but obviously I can understand that a lot of people didn't like hearing what I had to say. It's not, yeah, it's not a popular opinion kind of thing. It's kind of like, I can understand it hits like a place a lot of people don't be comfortable with, but me personally, I'm comfortable with speaking about it, enough to speak about it at least. So I was just like, I'm going to do it. And then that episode was the outcome, at least what I could get into it. Yeah. I mean, so when it comes to gap years, when I moved to Glasgow, my parents put me in a private school. I think they did it because they just wanted me to have like good support but it didn't necessarily end up that way I just ended up being with a lot of wealthy people and I I don't come from a wealthy background so that was just odd so when it comes to like a gap year when I did my gap year I was living at home I was commuting you know trying to get stuff that was paid so that I wasn't always doing stuff for free and I was comparing it with people from my school who did their own gap years and there was a girl who did like scuba diving and then she did an art course in Italy and then she did bungee jumping in New Zealand so yeah people who can afford it they can have ridiculous gap years but it's not it's not the same for everybody yeah I, was, I only said it's about the two years in Scotland thing because I didn't think you could I don't know pick up that much of an accent only after two years and like quite late on as well I think because of the fact that I've 
I was in the UK for a little bit when I was a teenager and then I moved back to India and then I came here again. The best way for me, I always tell people I'm an accent salad. Like I don't really, <laughs> I don't think you could hear me and just be like, yeah, your accent is definitely from only one place. I, I did yeah. a year ago in Canada and I'm sure that had some kind of hmm. knock on effect um, similar to Tam Kaur. Like I, I think I went a year before Tam. But yeah, there was just wherever I go, it seems like I tend to pick up something. But I haven't picked up anything from Birmingham, so give it time. Uh, yeah, I was gonna say like I think it's only certain words that the Scottish accent comes out on because otherwise it's quite ambiguous. I can't tell. Like, I, couldn't, <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't tell what it was. Yeah, apparently when I say Glasgow, people yeah. are like, oh, yeah, God, yeah, you're from Glasgow. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe people are just more susceptible to it than others. I guess. I mean, I do find it interesting that people love breaking down accents. I don't know. It probably comes from people's need to like put somebody in a box where they know yeah. where they're from. Like when people can't figure out where I'm from, I don't know. I feel, I feel like it unsettles them a bit. They're just like, where, what stereotypes can we link you with? I think it's usually quite fun to leave it ambiguous because yeah, that I, cause you can see other people guessing and you can see their frustration. So it's actually a bit, I don't know how you say it. Like it's a bit funny just watching other people trying to figure it out because you're, you unsettle them until they figure out or you spent like, you know, five years there, five years there, blah, 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 blah. I think it's the same with names as well. Yeah. I think we've had people come on the podcast expecting to see like an Aaron Conway and a Hamish Lackmain. And then uh, <laughs> not, that not expecting like two, uh, two brown kids. I don't know. <laughs> Hamish is a Scottish name as well. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's always, that was really interesting. You know, fun fact, Hamish isn't my actual name. It's just a mistake on my birth certificate. So... Do you want to tell us what the mistake was now then? No, no, no. Because um, it's a solid game I get to play to hustle people out of money. So basically only one letter. There's a typo in one letter. So out of the six letters in my name, if you change one letter, for example, you'd get my actual name. So that leaves you with so 150 possibilities of what you can guess. But if you guess it, if you agree to this, if you guess it in the first 10, this wouldn't be on air because I, I don't want other people to reduce the possibility for themselves. If she agrees to the deal, she has 10 chances and it's a £10 bet usually. So if she gets in the t in the 10 guesses, then I'll give her 10 quid. Otherwise, she'll have to send me 10 quid at the end of it. But I won't reveal my actual name if she doesn't get it in the first 10. You're Gujarati, aren't you? Don't put me in a box. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, I think I'm just trying to think of like Gujarati names that are. I don't know if it would, that would help, but if it helps you, then go ahead. <laughs> Remember that it's only one letter difference. It's not an addition or anything less. Yeah. Just... Oh my god. Right. I think I'm gonna think about it. Okay, think about it. Yeah, go Wait. So you agree to the ten pound bet? I agree to the ten pound bet. Oh shit. Okay. But yeah. I forgot how we ended up on this tangent. I won't yeah. Know. No, I'll shift subject a bit. So this episode, if I have done my maths right, should be coming out the week before Freshers for Warwick University. And I thought it'd be interesting. Most of our listeners are from Warwick. And maybe just share some of our, like, I don't know, experiences at Warwick, uh, what we thought, like some, I guess, fresher tips. Maybe you don't have any, or maybe stuff we've done that we wouldn't have done. I guess the best place to start is kind of like, what was your first, I guess, first day at Warwick? What, what did you do? Right. So my, actually, my first day at Warwick, obviously, I think a week before I told my parents, I was like, yeah, are you guys going to come with me and help me settle in? And they were like, yeah, yeah, we're going to do that. And then maybe about three days before we started, my dad was like, listen, I can't make it. Okay, I have a... <laughs> I have a singing ceremony. So uh, we're Bengali and Bengalis are huge on music. And dad was like, no, I have to go to that. But like Indians know Indians in every part of the world. So my dad was like, I have a friend in Birmingham. He will help you settle down. Okay. And I will come see you shortly after. I love this accent and this impersonation <laughs> that you're doing right now. I can confirm the accent is genuine because people hear it and then they meet my dad and they're like, oh, like I'm not putting it on. Yeah, yeah. It's honestly how my dad sounds. Listeners are going to feel like they have another person on the, on the podcast. <laughs> Switch between me and my dad. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so I was dropped off with this Indian uncle and his family who haven't met me for years and they were like hi we're gonna get you settled into Warwick yeah great so we went to like one of those like what was it like an Ikea or something and we got some like plates and stuff then they helped me move in and they were like bye <laughs> like, <okay>. <laughs> <laughs> see you later uh, and then a day later my parents showed up and they're like oh wow very nice very good what uh, accommodation did you stay in I stayed in Roots, the Roots that is just behind the SU. Okay. So from my room, you could hear pop 
every Wednesday, I want to say. Whoa, was Roots wow. much of like a, I think going into uni, there was a reputation of Roots as like the party accommodation. I don't know. I mean. I don't know where I heard that from, to be honest. I think it was just like forums or something. People told me that. But It is lots of people. So I wasn't quite as bad as like Cryfield in terms of how crowded it was. But I shared a kitchen with 18 people, which is a lot. Wait, um, yeah. What? Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah, 18 people is a lot. <laughs> that's probably why me and Sonali became so close. Sonali moved into Bluebell and maybe similar to what Hamish does, I make fun of Sonali's privilege all the time. Oh my God, Sonali, the Bluebell life. He shared a flat with four people. So, you know, me in a kitchen with 18 people, I kept using it as an excuse to basically go buck Sonali. And I think that's how we ended up being really good friends by the end. Because I was like, hey, I'm here. My kitchen's full of 18 people and your kitchen barely has anybody in it. So let's hang out. What did you do in the first day, Hamish? I tried to meet the few people that had moved in on the same day. Because I, I basically arrived in the morning because I was, I was, as people probably know, I'm an early bird. So I arrived there. I was pretty much the first one there on that Saturday. And then I was just trying to figure out, you know, the area. Because there was no one in my flat at this point. When, when, when people did move in, it wasn't, I think only one of them I kind of got on with um, right away. But. It wasn't like enough for them to like, because they didn't do partying or anything. So I remember on the first night, I went to the freshers party by myself. Um, I went in the queue, just made some friends, hung out with them the entire night. Do you still keep in contact with them? No. Uh-huh. That's a shame. <laughs> yeah, but I wouldn't say my flight experience was a good thing. And I, I would obviously redo so many things differently, but I guess the learning experience is something I wouldn't take away. What would you redo? I would maybe like venture to the other flats earlier and try to, I don't know. I don't know how I'd be more social. I, I just, that's just my lacking of social skills, isn't it? So um, I just try to friend people in other flats earlier on, like just venture down the corridor and upstairs beforehand. I'm really sorry to interrupt, but you don't know your name. Oh, I thought, I thought I got it. Sorry, continue. I don't know. Like, I feel like, as I said, I think I mentioned it in the past, like the social skills weren't there, but if there was one thing I could redo is maybe like go down the corridor, try to find some of the people I'd met later on earlier. Then again, like, I guess it had to happen for it to end up where I am here today. So I'm fine with that. But yeah, I do think I missed out as a result on a lot of partying, etc. And a lot of know-how on uni. Because the only thing I kind of knew was the thing I was reading up. Because yeah, I was a very different person to what any of my flatmates were. So it was, just, it was just a bit of a weird one, I guess. I don't know what else to really add to that. So I came, got dropped off. Oh, yeah, you were dropped off by a fam? Oh, I just yeah. arrived in one suitcase by myself. I was like, yo, I'm here. Were you nervous about coming to uni? Me? Like, yeah. I was gassed because of the restart. I said that I didn't want to be anywhere near my area, so I was gassed for it. It was a bit scary, I'm not going to lie, because I had to try to like, meet these people and then try and forget everything, apart from trying to socialize or meet new people, because I wasn't very experienced at that, at that point. So I remember walking up trying to figure my way around campus. It wasn't too complicated, because I had never been campus as well on open days. So I remember just going up to the person trying to ask, yeah, I think this is my accommodation thing. Um, how do I get the key and so on? And then they just guided me and then they pretty much walked me to my accommodation. Luckily, I was ground floor. That made my life very easy to move in. <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. Like, basically, I found out afterwards that everyone comes in a car or anything. I'm like, yeah, boy, I wish I was rich. <laughs> and then I was like, nice, cool. But don't worry, my kids will be rich and then they'll get that privilege to move in like that. But until then, <laughs> we stay on the grind. So the thing is, I, I just wanted a man pad. So I brought like a bean bag with me. I brought like my <laughs> dartboard, my guitar. I was, I was like, I had a crib in like first year um, wait what, what accommodation were you in I, I was in jack martin so it wasn't like a massive crib but i like made it into you know a respectable living situation people say all kinds of shit about jack martin no nah, no nah, that's just people who are jealous of jack martin <laughs> that's just people from roots man. Yeah, if you say so. the, the only thing was i built this like really good looking like room and then had to pack it up every 10 weeks because you couldn't stay there yeah. during the break. Yeah, when I first came in, I treated it like kind of like a military, like I think like a army mindset where, you know, when you like go away and then you're just going to be at the given accommodation with a given like pillow, duvet, and then you just have a few of your like essentials. That's how I kind of treated it. I'm like, yeah, this is my life for the next few years. Yeah. And but then, yeah, basically I was like, yo, I can't sleep in a duvet, I think it is. And the pillow was dead, yeah. So basically what I did, yeah, I obtained, like, you know, the Duke of Edinburgh backpacks, like those big backpacks that you go backpacking with. I obtained that, went home, got like a blanket, got a pillow, got like, well, I say I got eight, I got my, the only ones I had. And then I brought them back up. And then when I had a chance, I went to Wilco and bought some throws. And then I just had a very comfortable bed. But I didn't use the duvet. The duvet was just 
there. Like, I don't know what to do with it because I had never used the duvet till that point. I couldn't navigate the duvet. So I was like, fuck this. What do you mean navigate? Bro, because it's it, not a map, bro. If you sh- if you like pull it or something or like move it a little bit, it starts misaligning it moves, out. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, yeah, fuck that. Uh, let me just have a normal blanket. But if you pull a blanket, it moves. No, but the duvet has a cover where inside the thing or whatever, it, if it gets out of place or it out of alignment, it's very tough to, I don't know. Basically, I couldn't use a duvet. So I don't use a duvet <laughs> anywhere I go. I have to just goddamn use a blanket or have no duvet on. Okay, fair enough. I mean, I, I found a blanket really weird because where I'm from in India, it's so warm. We don't really sleep with blankets. So the whole concept was a bit odd. But then you just get used to it, I guess, eventually. Yeah. I think what makes it easier for me is having throws. So you know those throws you get, those super comfy throws? Like even right now on my bed. So I basically sandwich myself in between throws. And that's how I just I'm have a comfy, like, I guess, bed. <laughs> because I don't know how to use like a duvet, so fuck a duvet. Yeah, so if any uh incoming freshers have this problem, um the trick is bring your blanket. Um <laughs> your blanket for sure. Yeah. When I when I moved in I so I read up on Warwick so much and just universe in general. So I feel like I going in I kinda like knew everything because I was so nervous. Just about you I was excited, but I was just really nervous. And then I could hear people in the kitchen, like next door. Because on my room was next to the kitchen, like the first door. And I just didn't leave my room. I was so like scared. Oh. To be fair, I had an excuse because May and I were playing West Ham at the same time. So I just put that on and just like <laughs> stayed in my room to the end of that match. Is this your first night? Yeah, yeah. This is like middle of the day. This is like 3 p.m. And then I knew one other kid from my school who, well, there was a few other kids, but there was another kid who had a number of who from my school. Or like I'd talked to a bit, but I wouldn't say he's like a close friend. But he was just someone I knew. So I just like messaged him being like, hey, do you want to meet up? Because I did not want to go into my kitchen and meet like new people. Or like, not that I didn't want to meet new people, but it was just like, it's I was scary. just so, yeah, I was just so, so scared. Yeah. Do you remember that thing for the first few weeks where you run into people and you just say the same stuff on repeat? Like, hi, I'm Anu. I live at Roots. I study politics. Yeah. What about you? And that, that's just becomes, I said, but I think the more you do it, it becomes a bit less intimidating. You know, when meeting people, yeah, I find it easier, like if you're already doing something in common, not, I don't mean like your degree or something, because that doesn't mean that you're going to get along, you know, amazingly well. But well, like, it definitely say, helps. Yeah, yeah like, it, it helps a bit. I won't lie. But I think like, for example, if you met someone at like a place where you're enjoying the same music. So for example, if you went to for like a hip hop society and you all just, you already have a good baseline to start talking. So you don't have to start with the basic course, you know, stuff like it could just stem from something like, Oh, I just came in midway through a 50 cent conversation so I can speak about that, for example. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like that's a lot easier than it is in computer science. Because in, say like, okay, say in our case, computer science, we'll try and sit next to some new people, but we don't want to snake the people that we already met. So we'll try and like introduce ourselves and then we'll try to still be friends with the people. But then you may get along with the next person more than the person you're already with, but you didn't want to snake them, but then you're still trying to speak to them. So it's like this complicated mess because obviously my social skills weren't up there. I, I don't know if, I think that might be in your head a bit. It may be in my head, to be honest. I don't think that was that politics. First few weeks, I really don't think anybody was... Nobody's saying that like the first conversation you have with someone is the foundation for an everlasting friendship. <laughs> yeah. But I think people have to remember that anyway. Like For new freshers, you have to remember that just because somebody isn't speaking to you, it doesn't reflect on what they think of you. It doesn't necessarily mean that they think you're not cool or they don't think you're interesting. People gravitate towards whoever they do. I, I genuinely, I think for uni, so many people became best friends because of the people they live with, other people from their course, other people from their societies. There is no one way to make yeah. decent friendships. Uh, it might even be from a job that you do on campus with someone else. So that's worth remembering. I think that's, you know, just for a piece of advice. Mm-hmm. You never know where your good friends are going to pop up from. So just be open to the possibilities yes so uh, one thing as well is that people may be finding it tougher to i guess settle down than um yourself or so which makes it like because you can't you can't imagine i guess for them like if they've ever moved out or so like what they're what's going through their heads at the time as well so it may be like tough to speak to people as it is so yeah that was one thing i had kept in mind because i was like i want to just be away at uni i could introduce myself to people but my conversation was just lacking at that time that's the way i see it meeting other people doing like different hobbies and stuff but you didn't really join many societies did you no because i didn't grasp that concept not gonna lie i didn't realize what societies and stuff were till i guess it was too late so i guess if anyone's listening who doesn't also know what societies are it's just like i guess a group of people doing an activity 
Pretty much, yeah. Warwick has tons of them. Yeah. Yeah. Please look them up. I was giving my brother this advice because he's about to start uni soon. I was like, look, the first thing you need to do, look at societies and clubs, see if there's anything that's interesting and then go try them all out. Doesn't matter how many hours it takes over your first few weeks. You may find one that you want to stick with or so, even if it's a bit uncomfortable. And then that'll be the first good thing. So I told him, like, try do one sports club and one at society if you can. Or you could do two sports clubs, whatever you want to do. But just make sure you go to these things from the first few weeks so you can at least get some social grasp because otherwise it's just even harder to fit in if your social skills aren't all that. And then not in a disrespectful way to my brother. I just know that in our school, the social skills are all lacking like heavily. So because you don't really meet new people, you stay in the same clique. And that's just kind of sadly, I guess, how our school was. So I was like, look, yeah, just go meet new people. It doesn't matter if, if you're boys and whatever from home or with you but just go meet new people you never know um who's going to become your best friend you may meet someone like bloody aaron and start a podcast with them four years down the line and so on but yeah i was just trying to like give him that example like yeah just do it from day one and do the research beforehand Anu, did you join any i joined a couple so obviously i went to bungra society maybe not because i wanted to be really good at it but still i went along and that's what counts i went for as long as like as long as that guy was there I found out that he had a girlfriend and then I was like, oh, this. I feel you, I feel you. And then I I stopped going because it was too painful. (laughs) I couldn't go every week. And then she, she was, I think she was on the exec for Bangor Sock and they were really professional about it when they did, you know, classes. They'd never like, there was no PDA and they, maybe they just look at each other sometimes. But the more I knew, I was like, I can't go just too far, (laughs) stay away. He's too beautiful. <laughs> to this day, like my so the student that I teach in Birmingham, they all know I went to Warwick. And students have so much free time, teenagers especially. Uh, it's a bit scary. And they were like, oh, Miss Roy, we, we found a video of you, yeah? Bangra dancing. <laughs> I was okay. like, how? And apparently Bangra Salk put up like a teaser video to get more people to come and join. And I'm in it for maybe like five seconds. I'm just in a, like a bright blue hoodie and I do like a move. And they're like, Miss Roy, what were you thinking, man? That's what is up with you? I'm like, right, guys, the truth is I had a crush on the guy who was running it. <laughs> and they were like, oh, okay, we get you. Yeah, that makes sense. Oh, fair enough, fair enough. At least you're honest with it. That's good. I am, yeah. I read that. Um, yeah, so I did Bangor Sock for a bit. I wrote for the bore on and off. That kind of stopped when I did my year abroad. And then when I came back... I started like volunteering with some of the kind of mental health volunteers on campus. But yeah, I think that was it. I, I wouldn't say I did a lot, but I was worried about just my degree. and. Yeah, I, th- I think, yeah, I probably should have joined more. I mean, I joined a few and then just didn't really attend any over the whole year. So I wish I like participated a bit more. That's another thing. During Freshers Week, I obviously went out, but I was not really used to like drinking or any of that kind of stuff. So I really wasn't, and the other like guys and girls in my kitchen were like so much more than me. So I, n- I never felt like too comfortable. Like they always went out like every night or whatever during freshers. And I kind of, there were some nights where I, quite a lot of them, I just didn't really. I wish I did, but I was so glad I didn't. I was a bit responsible and I probably, it probably wouldn't have ended well if I <laughs> just went hard during freshers. Yeah. Drinking culture is really, it's really complicated topic at uni because some people, like I've got friends who are Muslim and they didn't really know how we can separate like socializing from drinking culture sometimes, especially when you're like brand new in a flat and you're just meeting people and drinking comes so naturally to other people, but you might have specific reasons why you can't do it. And then you kind of, you might feel a bit like, oh, well, does that mean I can't really make friends or is there some kind of stigma because I can't drink with you? So that's, yeah, it's a bit tricky. But I do think like, like I said, like there's so many ways to make friends. A lot of the people who drank a lot and went out a lot in my flat aren't necessarily friends anymore. So you might want to ask yourself like why you're doing it. If you're doing it to meet people, they might not necessarily be the people that you end up being like really good pals with. And they might. You know, there's there's no one way of guaranteeing it. I was telling my brother this, like, you don't have to go drink and party every night. Like, I understand you're going to do a bit of it anyways. And I'm not against it. Just try not to make yourself in a state where you're hospitalized many months ago from doing it without no one knowing. So just basically do it responsibly, but you don't have to drink to make friends. Like, there's other ways. You can just have, go have dinners with them on a daily basis if you want. Like, there's hundreds of ways you can make friends. You don't have to have alcohol. 
I think in fourth year as well, like I learned that quite a bit when I stopped drinking basically. And I was just like, it was, I'm not going to lie, being around people like that were always drinking. I was just like, I don't know, maybe it was a bit unsettling, but I, it didn't bother me it's too pressure. much. It's pressure. Yeah. It's like social kind of yeah. pressure. Yeah. yeah. I think it was more the sense that like, I don't know, sometimes they're like, I guess alcohol allows people to do stupid shit. And you're just there like, oh, fuck, not this again or something like that, you know? Alcohol also like lowers people's kind of inhibitions. So if somebody is quite shy or they're a bit reserved, they might think that when they drink and they're slightly tipsy, that it just makes it easier for them to chat to other people. We've gone for like some, I guess, some like more deeper tips, like getting out of your comfort zone. And what about like... This would be more specifically for Warwick. So I guess our tips so far have kind of been broad. But what about like Warwick specific, any place? Hamish, I know you love the Lib Cafe. <laughs> Anu, did you live in Leamington Spa? I did live in Leamington. Yeah, so Leamington Spa is kind of like the town that most students, I guess, live in. Yeah. Student town close to campus. So you live on campus your first year. After that, you go outside. Yes, yeah, so Hamish was one who didn't live in Leamington. Only for one year you did. So yeah, I lived second year, I lived in Elsdon, so right next to the, the main bus stop where everyone got on and the main park. So the, I lived in a very convenient spot. It was easy access to city centre and easy access to campus. I could walk to campus. I know people wouldn't do the walk I did, but I was just one of those people that quite liked my walking because I wasn't used to taking that much public transport. So for example, a 40 minute walk to campus at my speed was for some reason nothing to me. And what else was there? There was third year LEM. I lived opposite Aaron, ironically. I did like Lem, but I feel like if you don't have a car, I don't think, yeah, I just don't think it's like fully worth it. Unless you can work from home, like quite well. I personally, that didn't work for me. Mm, that's true. Because I think I really liked Lem. I lived down the road from Smack uh, on the same road, just yeah. further left. I heard that story about when you guys couldn't get in. And I would have said, I said this to everybody. I'm like, if you can't get into Smack, just come around mine. I can't, I'll, I'll make you some chai. And <laughs> It got to the stage where my friends would be like, let's go to smack. And I'd go in my pajamas just to give them like moral support. And when they got in, I would walk back. That's friendship there. I know. Yeah. I mean, when it comes to like where you want to live, go with your gut. Because sometimes I think people, when you meet people at uni, especially in first year, you probably still haven't figured out who you really get on with, you know, who's good to live with. And this is the thing. Somebody might be a great pal, but they might not be good to live with. I think the two are completely separate. Some people, you're just not compatible living together. And you don't want to make that the reason why you have issues in your friendship. So live with the people that you think you're compatible with. And that's in terms of like your living habits. That's probably something people talk about before halls. I do agree with like, your best friend may not have the best living habits to go like that work with you. Even if you have, for example, a schedule and so on. Yeah, like, because I, I have a friend called Pavia. Shout out to Pavia. Love you, Pavia. <laughs> When she was at uni, she was like a wonder woman. She could juggle her degree and she did like five societies and she was socializing. She was going on dates. But then like I didn't see her around the house as much as I would have liked. I'm very sentimental that way. Just like as you can tell, I'm all like, come to the kitchen. Let's like, make you know, we'll have some tea and we'll chat. I must be an old woman in that sense. But that's what I liked about like, say, Sonali, because Sonali was always around and we hung out a lot and it was the best. And Sonali should have talked about that more on her episode, but she did it. So Sonali, I'm doing the work that you should have done <laughs> and acknowledging that you were the best housemate I could have. It was honestly, it was the best. It was a lot of fun. But that's only when it really lines up. If you're living with someone you're not compatible with, that can be a whole year of like tension and passive aggressive behavior. And you're ranting about it to your other friends that you don't live with. And that, you know, you don't need that. So just live with people that you know you're going to be okay with. And note that you can't have, I guess, in most cases, you're probably not going to have the perfect thing. So one incompatibility is still probably fine. So obviously my sleeping time probably didn't align with my my housemates um in the second third and fourth year but like everything else was usually all chill and calm so in fourth year especially like i know that they, they were like how do i say it like i'm early morning person they're i guess nocturnal maybe like late night person people so i know that was one difference i guess we had but it didn't affect anything else like because it was still a great house to live in if that makes sense yeah, just because you have one incompatibility doesn't mean it's the end of the world. Yeah, of course. Like if you live in a house where, you know, the energy is a bit off and you just want to, if that doesn't personally affect you, then, you know, fair enough. Like maybe you have solid friendships outside your house and those keep you going. Maybe you go home once in a while and you like doing that. It, you know, different people find ways to navigate that kind of situation. Yeah, I think that people should try Leamington at least for a year. I yeah. really liked Leamington. 
Yeah, to them all the way. But I think you'll just have regrets if you don't, like, because Leamington is yeah. the place where you've got Smack and Neon. They're the two, like, main nightclubs. A lot of the food places are also there, and they're a lot better than the Cov ones for the most part that I can remember. If you're gonna do, if you're gonna live in Lem, don't ideally live there in the last years or wherever the years are obviously gonna be waiting more in your degree. Like try to get it out in second year, and then yeah, and then try. I would say I would recommend like Canley is not a bad place. Just don't live too far away from I guess campus or live in the renovated part owned by Warwick Accommodation, and you'll be good. Um, Elsdon's still a safe choice, but I think Canley walking distance is. It's just too good, especially if you work on campus only. Like, it's just too, quite decent. You have the Tesco right there as well. You don't have many food options because it was outside of the delivery range. I remember that. So oh, no. I was going to say Warwick's not in the delivery range. Um, so it's, yeah. a bit, it's a bit tragic. Be aware of the, uh, if you're living in Lemonton, you've got to get the bus in. So you need to buy a bus pass and that's like 300 quid or so. And the buses aren't always the most reliable. I never really had any problems with it, but I know a lot of people seem to hate Stagecoach and hate National Express, so yeah, just be aware of that. If you live on the south side of them, and the buses tend to fill up, where I lived, which was like on the boundary between Lem and like when you leave, uh, all the buses were full, so that was not pleasant. The only advice I have is wake up early and just deal with it. Honestly, this comes back to <laughs> yeah, like yeah. what we were yeah. talking about way earlier about like privilege. And some people have the, you know, they find ways to like whine about uni. And I'm like, come on, yeah. get some perspective. Like you miss the bus. Yeah. On campus stuff, you've we got Dirty Duck, that's a pub, Varsity, another pub. Varsity is dead. Don't go Varsity. Save yourself that money. Terrace Bar is popular. Fusion Bar. I quite like Fusion Bar. Yeah. Fusion Bar, I found the food to be ridiculously quick. Like you order yeah. chips and then two minutes later it's there. I thought a majority of the food was like microwave food or out of the freezer. Maybe. I'm maybe. just quickly warming up. Give it to you. There is a Tesco next to campus. It's not exactly on campus. Cannon Park Tesco. Yeah, Cannon Park Tesco. So that's a lot cheaper than Roots Grocery Store. Yes, this is true. Don't forget Wilco. Wilkinson. Yeah. Oh, Wilkins. Yeah, yeah. There's Iceland there as well. Yeah, those three combination, you know, Iceland, Wilco and Tesco ultimate money saving combination there's also a boots there as well for anyone with any skin care needs <laughs> <laughs> so i feel like you did the whole like if any ladies need anything <laughs> it sounded like you were sponsored a bit no no, no. Uh, <laughs> where else was there in that place the sports direct there as well they, they, they're just trying to save you money they're literally trying to save you money um like there's a is there like a mini new look or am i thinking that in my head i'm sure there's a new look um, i think you might be right yeah yeah I an Asian right. shop, like they do, um, like an Asian food store, they do like... Oh yeah, that place that sold the bubble tea or whatever it was. No, 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 that's like a cafe, that's at the oh. front of Cannon Park. And then if you go around to the back where the boots and stuff is, there used to be at least like an Asian you know, grocery store. Okay. You can pick up, like for anybody who's coming who's international, who wants like Asian food, you get Korean food, Japanese food, Thai food. Everything on campus is quite expensive. For like what it is really actually there's one thing they need to know if they're going warwick if you can have a friend that has access to the wmg bit next to the in between engineering building and computer science there's a cafe in there that's incredibly cheap and you still can actually use your student discount on it via your warwick card and basically you can get like a meal and sides for under like five pounds so you'll be more than full and usually it's asian origin food so they'll have an alternating set of dishes on um, veg and you know, chicken and all of that the stuff. The guy who makes like tosas and stuff. No, 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 no. I mean like in WMG, they had this pit stop cafe. It was mainly for the employees and students of that. But basically I would sneak myself in. and That's my boyfriend. He works at WMG. <laughs> You've not been telling us about this. Like, See that exclusively on the third wheel. Exclusive uh, insight here. You, got, you have to go to WMG pit stop cafe. You, won't, you basically won't go back to Lip Cafe or something. If you, apart from a few dishes, maybe. It's the cheapest thing on campus. Nice. I didn't know that. Very, very useful. I found out, I mean, I only found out like in fourth year and I regret not having known that in the second and third year when it would have saved me a lot more money and had a lot more nicer food. I ended up getting those like sandwichy wrap things from the library, but it is overpriced. But I think when you're really hungry and you don't want to. Yeah. Like it is fresh. I'll give them that. Like the the food that they had in Lip Cafe and top, um, so on was like quite, was like quite, I guess, fresh. There's an Indian auntie who does like meals. You have to pay her and she drops them. I know you're talking about. 
on the first day, I, on one of the first days I arrived, I was walking to, back to Heron Bank and she was just standing there handing out a printed menu. Like it was just basically a bullet point list. And I remember taking it and I was, I asked my like, because my personal tutor, she actually told me, um, you should order from this auntie. I'm like, wait, is this the menu I have here in my bag? I'm like, yeah, yeah, this menu. I'm like, raw, must be good then. I, I tried it once. <laughs> it was quite spicy, I won't lie. <laughs> I've heard it's a bit intense. Yeah. There's a Malaysian auntie as well now, I think. And so many aunties. Trisha, Trisha Treat. <laughs> There's something called Trisha Treats and they do do drop offs and stuff to Warwick Campus, Leamington Spa and somewhere else. That is like, I think for like three pounds, you can get like three sides or something like that. The price is probably different now, but that's also one if you want um, Indian food. And they have a rotating menu, so you can actually choose whether it's veg, whatever, whatever. Yeah, we had them on for Chibo. Rest in peace. <laughs> that, that's how I like knew of Aaron. Like I've I've heard of you because Sonali. Oh, Beano. Oh shit, Beano. Yeah. She was doing for Chibo <laughs> in final year. But yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think. Oh, I had also when you said like make friends with someone from like WNG, whatever. Make friends with a computer scientist, yeah. Because if you don't do computer science, one of your only options is library. If you want to go study. If you make friends yeah, with a computer yeah. scientist, the computer science guys, we have so much space, 24-7 access to just like computers and desks or whatever. I just used to bring like my housemates when the library was like full just to come to computer science and like yeah. study or revise or whatever. So we'd, we'd let in quite a bunch of our friends to just go study there. Everyone had enough space to spread out across the room and just all the labs and just, you know, just work, revise, whatever they had to do. And, and just no nice, really... just like more space yeah. and we got a lot of... Uh, Good, good shit. I think we also, a lot of places didn't have, you know, the hot boiler type thing in the tap that we had. So a lot of people would just come make coffee quite easily um, because we yeah. had that hot boiler thingy. Microwave, boiler, anything. The politics department, they used to at least, have a free coffee machine. Wrong. Oh, I think I heard about this, yeah. You have to find out the code for the door. And I don't know if we'll get into trouble for all that. <laughs> but it's free coffee. You can, I think they, they even do hot chocolate, some teas and stuff. So do it because you're paying a lot for your degree. So you know, I, I don't feel bad. Drink prices. I think, what is it? If you use your student card, you get 10% off? 10% off at any Warwick place. Any Warwick food cafe place On or campus. whatever or drink place. Yeah. I didn't actually think drink prices were that expensive. I don't know if either of you two. Well, I know Hamish doesn't drink anymore. I don't know if you drink. I, know. I drink socially. So I won't say like I, I didn't do it in massive amounts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I found like Lem more expensive. So for example, there's like a wine bar on the parade, which is quite expensive because I guess Lem actually has lots of like young working professionals as well who make a decent amount of money. So a lot of establishments don't have to put their prices down just for students. But if you're a student and you don't want to miss out, you just end up overspending and then, you know, you live off of like all for four weeks or <laughs> something like that. Yeah. Yeah, I think with the discount, from the student card, it, it works out all right. Not too bad. Dirty Duck, you get like a free beer or something if you have like a specific meal. There's quiz nights on like one of the Dirty Duck days. It probably sounds not very helpful with itself. So there's lots to do on campus. Pop is a very popular dead night out, Wednesday night out. If you like, like pop music and stuff like that, there's also something called circling where it's like drinking games for like a few hours before pop. And you drink a drink called purple. I think this is a Warwick only thing, purple. Purple is a Warwick only thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is, yeah, I don't, I don't even know what goes into that. But um, it's purple, so hence the term purple. And I thought it was just Ribena and uh, a cider or so. Probably. So that's cool. Uh, Dominoes, I'm sure that you get really cheap. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They're always, especially during freshers, like weeks. My flat won a whole chicken at Nando's, so we got on a bus. Oh, and the spin the wheel thingy. Yeah, 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 yeah. We want a chicken each. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> it's just ridiculous. <laughs> but all 18 of us got on a bus and we went to the Nando's in uh, Coventry and we redeemed our free chicken. Nice. One key thing as well, always make sure you check out the, when the student deals are available at places to eat and so on so you can make the best use of them because that will save you a bunch of money, it's meaning that you can do it again over and over and over again. So yeah, please definitely do that. Unless you're a baller. <laughs> Did either of you make use of Warwick Art Centre much? What was there in Art Centre, really? There, there was a really cinema. Anything. I went to a cinema a couple of times. There was also a theatre in there. 
Because the student tickets are like four quid and sometimes they I do have went, films. I think are... I went once, but I don't think I'm in the art center. Was it? Did they do it in L3 by any chance? The physics place. Oh, are you, well. are you talking, oh that's, a student, that's a student cinema. But in the art oh. center, it was like a proper cinema. Yeah, I went to like the student version, like where I'm sure there was a society that yeah, yeah. put on movies on a projector. Uh, also the politics department. If you went to watch a documentary, they gave you free pizza. So I did that a couple of times. Yeah, yeah. Just go go to events and get free pizza. That's honestly. Yeah. Not, Aaron, COVID is not going to happen. Oh yeah, that COVID is. I, that's going to be so. It's weird giving advice about uni with COVID stuff though, because I don't, I don't know what the what everything's going to be like. But I don't want to be negative about it. Yeah, yeah. People will still enjoy uni, but that's yeah. It's worth. I forgot when we were talking. There may be more food vouchers available, like takeaway vouchers or anything, if anything, instead of like eating, you know, free in person or whatever. So that could be slightly beneficial. It depends on how much of a stay at home person you are, really. I don't know if there is much else. Bread oven, that's a popular place. It's like a subway, but on campus. Curiosity, a little like coffee shop. What was that? What's the one that started with X? Zanana? Yeah, okay, that one. They've changed the name to something else. I think that place I had a, once I had the fajitas. Was a banging for here, the veg for here, or whatever it was. I don't know where it was, but you haven't even mentioned Libcaf. Yeah, yeah, Libcaf. Well, I think that's like everyone's gonna. It's right in the middle, so everyone has to kind of go to it, right? Yeah, yeah. But you, that was Libcaf has a good bunch of options. They cater to a lot of food requirements. Yeah. So it helps, but it is a little bit pricier than, as I said, it may be nearly double the price, if, especially if you get a meal deal. I never got a meal deal personally, from, compared to Pit Stop, so the WMG place. WMG, I have to say, is like, you have to try it. And if you're Asian, it will be a bit spicier, sadly. So do keep that in note. But their food has much more flavor and much more taste. But there's certain dishes. I'll tell you the dishes from Lip Cafe you have to try. Falafel burger. Falafel wrap. <laughs> They're two different types of falafel as well. They actually um, have two different recipes. I know I know, I sound like a mug right now, but <laughs> I care enough about my food to know. Um, if you eat chicken, the Southern Fried Chicken Burger was lit. What else was there? I think there's also a chicken or veg burrito. I forgot which one it was that they had. That was decent. I think that's like basically all the good food that they had. The jalapeno wrap was good. Oh, I think I've actually, yeah, I think I've had that before. It's like a mixed cheese, like three types of cheese and jalapeno wrap. Oh, I wouldn't have it then, yeah. I just would have avoided cheese. <laughs> what else is there in Lip Cafe? I'm trying to think. There, there was definitely chips, a chips were that never... quite cheap, were they? It was like £1.50 for a box of chips. I don't know. They're probably £3 now. It's, it's Warwick Lip Cafe. Don't they do a full breakfast for like £3.50 or something? I think it was English breakfast, right? I've never had it. So yeah. I tell you. Yeah. Yeah. They do a full breakfast for three fifty, which is pretty decent. Yeah. It's not bad. I always did that like before an exam. Don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> just the nerves. telling myself I've got my, I'm, I'm ready. <laughs> so yeah. I had one thing. Oh yeah. If, and if you want to like go out and stuff like that, Dave Ramsey, remember the name. You'll, you'll need that. Oh, I, 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 I did him on Facebook or something. He'll, you'll buy tickets off him, I guess. <laughs> I, was, I was like, who is this person? Yeah, he would send updates all the time. He would post something. Yeah, then... yeah. I don't, I don't know if either of you had any, uh, anything else to add on that. I think I kind of have to mention mental health at uni because mm. I still don't think enough people like talk about it. Everybody that gets there will have some things that they're going through for the first time, so it's it's completely normal. Like, don't feel weird about it if you feel overwhelmed or out of your depth but also if you do have like mental health issues that are coming up there's I'm trying to think of everything on campus that is available uh, there's student there's specific like mental health student societies that you can reach out to you should have in halls like some kind of what are they called like a hall supervisor basically the adult who has meetings with you guys and tells you to keep your kitchen clean <laughs> I know there's a name but I don't I don't think it's super... wardens was it the oh, wardens, wardens or like the sub wardens yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that person will also have links to kind of mental health services. A nightline. I think there was nightline. I remember seeing that in the Be good. And also just in general, like the uni health service, you can walk in and ask to speak to somebody. Yeah, I think just off the top of my head, those are some of the things. Yeah. Remember to speak to your personal tier as well. If they're not as useful, then I'm sure there's some other tier that you may get close to or something and then be able to speak to. Someone that you trust and someone you feel like comfortable speaking to about that kind of stuff. Still to this day, I don't even know if my personal tutor knew my name. <laughs> <laughs> That's because yours was happened to be the head of the department at the time. I, I thought I was so special because I had the head of department as my personal tutor and I was his only personal tutee. I was the <laughs> only person he had. I still don't think he remembered my name, but 
<laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll move. When my personal tutor got changed in third year, well, the personal tutor I had was dead afterwards. I was like, yo, I don't even want to see my personal tutor. It was just a waste of time. <laughs> I remember like sometimes we do group meetings as well. So I'd be there with like Josh Kavey and me and him would just be laughing about something. Yeah. And so that made it more bearable being in that session. But I was like, fam, if I'm going to have a personal tutor, it needs to be someone I can bloody speak to because this personal tutor is not, I don't think they gave a shit or they didn't know how to really be a personal tutor to students. Yeah, personal tutor training needs to be updated because the yeah. doesn't, I don't think they do a decent job of it yet. But the one for my first year is Dr. Soro Kalval, I think. She was like, she was really, really good. She was really good with like, I think students in general, like being the friendly face. And I think she understood as well that the background I kind of came from. So I, I was struggling to fit. And I remember talking to her in the first to tell them like, yeah, I don't know how this is going, but basically I'm just trying to work, but the work's too hard. I don't know what to do. I remember telling her that. And she was like, yeah, just keep trying to focus on work. I'm like, and you try to like meet new people where possible. I remember um, keep updating me, blah, blah, blah. She was, she was basically very comforting as a, personal tier but i can't say the same oh my god then personal tier in third year i just uh i just googled warwick university just to make sure just to check if there were any like other scandals we'd have been involved in that we could oh. talk about. but to be fair i just just seen um we mentioned bus passes stagecoach bus passes and they've reduced the price by 40 quid this year so lucky because people aren't going to be getting guys. on it <laughs> lucky guys 300 quid now actually i said it was 300 quid earlier but um Apparently it was 340. I think the National Express one is cheaper. So if you don't mind having a slightly longer journey sometimes, then you should probably definitely consider that. And I think they accept contactless as well. So that was a big difference compared to the stagecoach ones. Try making friends with somebody who drives. They're by themselves in their car. So I don't think it would be a massive ask to just, if you're the same way. If you want to offer pain for fuel, fair. I did. Sorry to my friend who drives. Um, <laughs> I always did. Yeah. I was one of those people that had to, I felt like it was common courtesy, but obviously I understood that people at uni didn't see it that way. They're like, we're going the same way. So it doesn't matter. But I'm like, no, but can I please pay for fuel? Because I don't want to do this. Even though obviously some friends are really nice and would pretty much avoid it. Luckily, a couple of them, it was very easy to make, you know, the terms with like, yeah, we'll just agree on this much fuel. We drive in every day, 7am during revision period. And then we just work through the day, drive back same time. If you can find that, that's actually pretty decent. Stuff like gym and all that. I, I did join the Warwick gym for like a few years and like did a bit of swimming and stuff. I think there's a new like center. There is. Yeah. But I think that's like 300 quid or something for the year if you're a student around that. I'd say it's worth if you decide to go and maybe join sports clubs as well. Like you should probably join at least one sports club if possible. Oh, it's, it's worth mentioning, actually, that some societies you do pay. Depending on how long you go on for that society, they'll there'll be like a membership fee and it's not much, but it's worth thinking about just, you know, because budget might be something that people get worried about. You don't have to pay for everything. Just, you know, do what is comfortable in your budget. Awesome. Yeah. Any, anything else on Warwick or university? Don't buy too many things. Like just because you think you may need it one time, they're probably going to give you a version to use for that one time you may need it. So, or you could rent it. Well, that's just general uh, life, a life tip. Yeah, but at uni, as a new student, I don't think you understand that concept as much. Like, you think you need everything brand new for whatever can happen. Whereas sometimes you may actually not need, like, an item that you need once in the entire year. So, Anu, moving on a bit, you studied, I think you said you studied politics? Yeah. Yeah, you're now a teacher, an English teacher. Yes, I'm an English teacher. People who do politics end up doing all kinds of stuff. We've got some people who are now, you know, working, who are lawyers, some people who work in media politics is quite varied that way mm -hmm. I think for me it was just like I've always wanted to study anything that's to do with people I wanted to always be in an environment which is quite like I didn't want like a desk job and I wanted to be able to speak to people and kind of make a difference I don't know why that sounds cringe it's not meant to I genuinely do want to make a difference probably because also I've been in private education I've been in state education um, so I have like a, I, I've seen a lot of schools. I've been in five schools altogether. Mm. So I, I have, I probably have like a different view of education compared to other people. Uh, so there's a graduate scheme called the Teach First scheme, where usually if you want to be a teacher, you have to go back and kind of do uni again. Uh, it's called a PGCE. It's a uni degree. And I think you pay, you know, the standard kind of 9,000 something a year to do it. So the difference with the Teach First scheme is they pay for you to go to uni part-time and for you to earn as a full-time teacher. 
So you're you're fresh out of uni, you're working a full-time teacher's job, you're making that money. And then on top of it, the degree that you get through the Teach First program is paid for. You don't have to pay anything, which I, I really like the sound of it. And that's why I applied to the program and I got in when I was in final year. So I literally like graduated, had a few weeks off, and then I started teacher training. What uh, year do you teach? Like what age group? I teach secondary, so year seven up to year 11. Okay, cool. How'd you find that teaching like older kids? So you can choose to do like what we call early year or primary, or you can do secondary. I wanted to do secondary just because I thought it'd be more interesting. I think primary, there's a lot to think about, but you're always like child safety is a big thing. And I feel like in some cases you are kind of secondary parent because you want to make sure, you know, the primary school kid is not lost and they're not like, they've not hurt themselves and that kind of stuff. Whereas in secondary school, it's less about that. I really like it, probably because I am slightly closer in age to the kids I teach compared to the rest of my colleagues. I'm not trying to shade them, just saying. <laughs> <laughs> so I think there's just stuff that, like I said, like the whole Bhangra thing, like we can just chat about stuff openly. And I, I find it like easy to get on with them. But it, it's a, so I teach in like a low income neighborhood um, in Birmingham. And it, it, there's a lot of stuff that comes with the job that can be a bit like overwhelming sometimes just in terms of like gang violence and drugs and like grooming is a big thing um, in the area that I teach in. So just us being aware of like what might happen to individual kids and yeah, that, that kind of stuff can be a bit just, yeah, just a bit stressful, but I, I wouldn't like wouldn't trade it for anything. Yeah. Is it a mixed school? Yeah. It's a mixed school. Uh, it's like majority like Pakistani, um, like 96% of the kids who go to our school are Pakistani from kind of, yeah, like we call them like pupil premium backgrounds. So when you go to school, the government has some funding for you to be able to like get through school and stuff with, you know, help you with meals and things like that. Yeah. And then in the age group, I forgot, did you say, did you mention like A-levels as well? My school doesn't have a sixth form, so we stop at we stop at year eleven. Okay, so did you have? I know the uh, A level results and all of that was quite recent or a bit. Yeah, because what happened is the A level stuff was complete chaos. So the government said we're going to go with the grades that the teachers predicted. Yeah, and the Utah. We decided that before the GCSE stuff came out. So GCSEs were less hectic, but I still think some people didn't get the grades they wanted. Grades are a tricky thing anyway, but I will say I don't think GCSEs were as affected. As the, the A-level stuff was pure chaos, but it wasn't as bad when GCSEs came out. So what was the whole, like, people that maybe don't, don't really know what happened with all of that? So what happened is, ages ago, when COVID became, you know, more prevalent, the government said, we're going to cancel all exams. But when we were all wrapping up school, so when they were saying, we're going to go into lockdown, one of the first things that we were told to do as teachers was to predict a grade. And this is because uh, there's a government organization called Ofqual who will, they want to standardize the way that students have results so that different people from different areas aren't discriminated against, you know, based on where they live. So teachers all predicted a grade and then Ofqual made the decision that they were going to use like an algorithm to decide who gets what grade. Now the algorithm made no sense in comparison to teacher grades. And then it turned into this thing where people said, well, teachers are going to give the best grade for their kids because they want them to do well. That's biased. So we trust the government. And then as it happened on the day, like millions of students got grades that made absolutely no sense. Also, the grade took their postcode into consideration. So what that means is if you were a high achieving student in a low income area, you were discriminated against based on where you went to school in comparison to say, so it's worth mentioning that uh, people who went to Eton had zero difference in any of the grades that they got. So if you are more likely to be from a wealthy area, go to private school, you're probably in a smaller group. Your cohort is smaller. Your school has more one-on-one -on -one time. And the algorithm benefited people who went to private school. And then people from state school had huge variation in the type of grades that they got. I was just going to add on to the, the algorithm was actually... It didn't even have a, I think it just scraped a 60% accuracy thing on testing data that they had. So they didn't even have like, they hadn't fully properly like tested this on a wild scale before or anything. And they only did it on a small sample size and they were like, yeah, oh, 60% is good enough to just fire out to the entire population. And 
No, not gonna lie, this situation had me fuming, yeah. I'm just lucky that I wasn't on the receiving end of this year. But I was fuming at this year because if, say, if I was that many years back and this happened to me, I would have never made it to Warwick because my predicted grades also, like, based on the school's algorithm, weren't actually accurate to what I got. So, like, I got way higher than my predicted grades for the most part, apart from one thing, which I guess kind of, like, had to happen. But, like, my predicted when I went into the beginning of A-levels was, like, A, B, C, D. I ended up after the first year with A, 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 D. So one thing was correct. I'll, I'll give them that. <laughs> and then at the end of it, my predictions were, I think it was like, what was it? I think it was like A, B, C or something like that, you know, at the end of A2 because you only have three modules left, but I got A star, A, C. So obviously they got the C bit right, but I'd obviously still done better than the other two predicted grades they'd give me. And I was just like, look, yeah, that would have been such a scummy thing because you're preventing people from like breaking out of the loop of like trying to make it and you're just, giving the advantage to people who already exist in that bubble or were fortunate enough to get to grow up in these circumstances. And this for me personally, just one of my things where I just get infuriated really quickly on the situation. But yeah, like I was just like, how could you, it was pretty much obvious that the statistics also showed that, you know, the privately educated and so on, they basically, as you said, they were unaffected. And I was like, of course, they're just going to make it so that those, that select audience can make it do do as well as they need so they can continue to run the country and so on and that's a whole d- different set of topics would your brother affected then you said he was he's going to uni i think because of the thing he had like a he didn't have full a levels so he had like b tech and a levels but i think he still got his firm choice but i don't i don't know if the fiasco affected him i didn't really ask him about that but from what i was aware <laughs> how, how, how <laughs> could you not ask him you said basically you were about yep. all of it because, yeah, like, I, no, no, because he was fuming because he was having to deal with the, the parents just telling him all this shit that wasn't even true. And I could see him arguing. So I was like, you know what? Yeah, right now, me telling him something is not going to go well. Let him have his little space that we have. And then when the time's right, I'll speak to him and get things in order. But then was just not the right time. So I'm not going to. When you're when you're angry and you literally and you try to tell someone or, or someone tries to tell you something, it's not going to go well. You just need to wait for it to cool off and. For them to see sense that obviously I know a bit more of what I'm talking about. I'm not going to tell you I know, I know exactly what's going to happen to you. But I can assist. But I can't tell you exactly that this magical scenario is going to happen. Because it's not at the end of the day. So I didn't want to just fuel his anger. And obviously I know the parents were probably against him living out. But then they're like, oh, nah, I did it. So obviously he's fair enough to do it, blah, blah, blah. There's just a whole lot of politics when you kind of grow up how he did. And he, he was like to me, yeah, I want my own room. I don't care what happens with COVID or anything. I just want my own room. I'm like, yeah, I was going to tell you to go live out anyways because I don't think you should live here and study. Like my other brother, I don't know how he did it. Big props to him though, but he did it. But I don't think, yeah, just knowing that other brother as well, I don't think he would have benefited staying at home, for example. So usually the way work in kind of January will predict something for you if you're in year 11. And then come May or June, you'll have the actual exam where you get to prove someone wrong, you know, because I didn't understand it when they said teachers under predict. We tend to just say where we think the student is. We might get it wrong sometimes, of course, but then students always have the opportunity to change that if they want to. And that's the good thing about exams. An exam is like a condition where everybody just has to show you what they can do if exams work. You know, unfortunately, exams aren't the best way to assess everybody. But the really, I think the really frustrating thing about the whole thing is also like just the government not admitting that they got something wrong. Yeah. So I was in, so I was in Glasgow because my dad lives in Glasgow. So I was visiting family. The, this all happened in Scotland before it happened in England. So the Scottish Qualifications Authority did the same thing. They got it wrong and they held their hands up and they were like, hey, let's change it. And that happened in a day. There were some protests, I think, from students and stuff. But the turnaround was much quicker. Whereas here, it was days of just arguing and questioning the education system. And teachers are biased. Don't trust them. And we did it fairly. And we're trying to make it fair. And hearing anybody who's a conservative use the word fair is just infuriating. Yeah. I remember also like people saying like, oh, if it's that much of an issue, then take a gap year and then go ahead, do the exam the year after. But this thing genuinely like pissed me off so differently. I'm like, if you live around the scenario where a lot of these people like working class and so on would have lived, a gap year is not an option. A gap year puts you one year back on life and a severe disadvantage because you're trying to make it out of this scenario in the first place. So you're putting yourself one year back. And for a lot of us, that isn't an option. It's like brute force drilled into our head. 
you have to make it. There's no stopping. There's no one year break. There's no one month break. You keep going. You get a job right after uni. So like you don't take a gap year. Obviously, if there's medical issues, please take the gap year. But like for a lot of people, like speaking from me personally and people I know, there's not this option to stop. Like you have to go ahead and as early as possible, get out of the scenario in. So like when you tell someone to take a gap year, when I was reading these articles and I saw some people saying, take the gap year, do the exams as a normal afterwards. I'm like, what the fuck are you saying? Like, do you realize what you're saying? Like, I understand that they were, I guess, too uninformed, miseducated or whatever, you know. But I was like, there's a point where I think some people just need to, you know, like, I guess, open their eyes and see that it's not as black and white as like saying, oh, I'll take the exam next year or whatever, you know, and then going, maybe you'll get into the same uni or whatever. But you have to remember the places, there'll be a lot tougher competition because if everyone does the scap year business, they'll be competing with the year below as well. So then a lot less people from that would even get a chance to compete and get into those top unis. And there was like so many like knock-on effects that I think people weren't just understanding. And I understand it's unprecedented times because everyone uses this goddamn, you know, inverted quotes, this saying like it's unprecedented times so you have to deal with them. I'm like, shut up, man. If they're voicing their, like a genuine issue and you're just shutting them down, then you're a prick. And you, uh, I'm not going to say anymore. Uh, that's just. Of course, it, it's it, it's unprecedented times, but people aren't saying this enough with COVID. Is that if you if life was already difficult for you in some ways, then the pandemic's just made that worse. If you are to any certain extent like well off or you have options because you can afford to have options, then COVID doesn't necessarily change that. But when you're running out of options, like if uni is the best option for you and your family then it's nobody's place to tell you that you have to put that off for a year. And also like a lot of the people, I just feel like, I don't think you would have seen anyone like from the scenario of these other kids, like even if the year is ahead of them now, saying that it was just like all these people who got to, even the media also like for some reason, it seemed like they were always promoting their voices over the people who are like fighting for like a little bit of fairness here or a little bit of a chance to make it through. I was just like, fam, I can't even look at social media. Um, or the trending tab because I'm just going to see something that just pisses me right the fuck off. So I was like, yeah, just let me, let me just avoid this. And I was just thinking of ways. I'm like, shit, man, is that I wish I could do like, so I wanted to do this year. I was meant to also do another one week of or two weeks of work experience for people from my school. But I had to fully cancel it because virtual access plus yeah work wasn't happening this, this year. So I was like, yeah, I can't do it this year. But the year before I did it and I remember I was like, because these people would never have a chance to I guess I would say one week work experience where I work. That's like such a big factor. And that's already taking away, like say like this set of 10 people that's taking away a massive, like, you know, a boost to their CV or so on, which helps them like later on in life. And I was just like, I can't already do this. And I'm just watching them just about to get shagged by whatever grading system and whatever people think is correct. But yeah, when you said the Scottish thing, yeah, I have like a bit more respect for the Scottish government because I see, it seems like they're always listening to people like they, they can hear the voices kind of whereas our ones are just like lord help me have harm when it comes to dealing with the politics that we have yeah it can be a lot i quite like nicola sturgeon when i see her like on tv what's people in scotland saying is that like is that just because we're here and we've got it worse or she came up in a time where like the scottish national party there was a lot going on especially with the independence referendum like the independence or scotland becoming independent is a big thing like it can divide friendship groups, you know, family members stop talking to each other because of it. But now that Brexit's happened, I think a lot of that might change. Nicola is like any other, you know, politician. You know, there's people who really like vouch for her. And then there's people who can't stand her. Um, she walked past me in a train station once. I was like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> She's just so, I think she is quite like humble. I'll give her that. Like she doesn't have any airs and graces. Um, She's happy to just say it like it is i'm not gonna say like nicola sturgeon is you know like unquestionably popular with everybody but there's been some research about kind of covid and how female leaders have handled it and there is i'm sure that there's something to say that like there are examples of countries whether it's new zealand whether it's germany where like female leadership has had some like positive effect on the way that they've handled covid so it's yeah i'll, I'll give prop props to nicola for kind of doing it that way my, my dad obviously being a doctor being a frontline worker it's reassuring for me to see that she takes COVID so seriously because then I'm not as worried about kind of dad getting sick because um, he's a lung doctor so he'll be like constantly 
kind of dealing with people who have COVID. So when the pandemic first started, I was really worried just because I heard stories about BME, um, healthcare, people dying and not having access to PPE. But when I saw that like Scotland is actually super strict about COVID and they're trying like a lot harder in some cases with the NHS there, it gives just a sense of like reassurance. So I will, I'll have to say that like that's something that I'm personally like really appreciative of. Yeah, I mean, like also to add on to the Nicola Sturgeon bit, like she obviously, whether it's her herself or her cabinet, like either way, like the people's voice seems to get through to them. They hear like the questions or like what was happening behind the scenes. They at least acknowledge what people are saying. Whereas like, for example, like there's many cases we could use in recent times from like the Marcus Rashford case to even that U-turn thing yeah, uh, recently for the grades. And I was just like, yeah, I wish we had some people with that just, I guess, try to convey the voice of the people more to the conservatives. But as I said, the conservatives agenda will never align with people other than themselves, really. So it was never going to kind of work out the same. But yeah, that's what that's what my thoughts are kind of on her. Like she has, if it's not her, she has a cabinet that definitely know, at least have a way of listening to people. Which is, it's reassuring in some sense. It's not every decision they make is going to be good, you know. Like, not everyone's going to agree with it. Even I don't agree with every decision they make. But I think they do a lot better than <laughs> what we have, Boris, the clown Johnson. Yeah, and, and for some things, you know, when you're trying to hold politicians to account, people disagree in different ways. But there's something about children and what affects children where everybody can just put their hands up and say, this, this is a messed up shit. We have to fix this. So I think the results stuff really did that, where people were like, this is not just about politics. This is like kids crying on national TV because they were predicted an A star and they got a U. People give you a U when you don't show up to the exam. So they're like, why did I get a U for an exam I didn't get to sit? And it's worse when, so there's this specific situation where you're a really good student, but you're in an area that's like considered a deprived area. Those are the students that have been hit the hardest. And I really feel for that because in a school where a lot of kids are struggling with like issues at home, it's really difficult to be the student that's like motivated to do well. I don't think people give students from low income areas enough props for all the shit that they have to go through when they're just trying to get to school. Like the rest of us will be like, oh, we wake up, we go to school, we study. For some kids, it's like I wake up, I've got domestic issues at home. Um, I don't know where I'm living. You know, you've got students who live in hotels in like care accommodation and they're trying to make it to school. So making it to school and studying is so different depending on like where you're from so for those students like if you can imagine somebody who's been living in like temporary accommodation and they're doing whatever they can to get their grades and then to be told that they have a you know a really rubbish grade that just hits different and i don't think everybody's like really appreciative of that so do you know like mitigating circumstances at uni yeah where like you'd have a problem at home or whatever reason or like an injury or something and then you'd file that and they'd take that into consideration yeah so have they just kind of done the opposite to that Kind of, but you have to be aware that like mitigating circumstances runs under the assumption that your life was going great. And then mm -hmm. one thing was a little bit off. So we're going to take that into account. For some people, people who live in like circumstances where, you know, either it's money issue or it's, you know, a domestic violence issue, that's, that's their life to a certain extent. I'm not saying they're defined by it, but I'm saying that's not a one-off thing that you can account for in a grade. That's there every day. And there's no institution that's equipped to say, okay, we know what you go through. So we're going to uh, adjust the grade accordingly. Like for example- oh, So you couldn't, you couldn't file for like mitigating circumstances for that? No, because like a refugee family, that's their identity. What institution is going to turn around and say, oh yeah, we're going to, you can have better grades because you've just fled a war, a war torn zone. Mm -hmm. Nobody does that. Whether they should do that is a whole other like conversation. Yeah. But at the moment in the education system, uh, the output is judged the same, even though the input is massively different. So just like, a small example, like when we were teacher training, they'd asked us to plan lessons, you know, and sometimes you have like a starter task. So as soon as you come into the classroom, you kind of do something to settle down. And I had a, another person on the program who was asking all the students like what they had for breakfast. And then we got told by like the teacher training kind of uh, organization that don't ask kids what they had for breakfast because there are some kids who don't have food at home and it just makes them self-conscious because they have to talk about or they have to like lie about it. There's so, like, that is the tiniest thing, like what you had in the morning and we're not aware of it, but then we expect the same grades from everybody 
the overall assumption is no matter where you come from, the grades speak for themselves. And that's why maybe sometimes we have this culture of no matter what, you have to make it because an A is an A at the end of the day. To add on, like, yeah, basically the refugees have it tough on a different level because usually they'll be chucked into like an area with a lot more refugees and that doesn't necessarily help the cause. There's a lot of like underlying other issues that occur from this. But yeah, when you say like the students have to like lie about the thing, so... One example I can give like first hand is that I used to lie that I didn't live in a flat because otherwise like at school, that would make my life bloody hell. And even though some people had already figured out, like some people knew that were close to me that I lived in a flat. But like, I remember like if you didn't live in a, like, you know, the house with your own room, etc. fam, your school life was going to be even more miserable than it was. And the teachers would know based on your address, you know, they can see the address is like, it has a letter on it, meaning they know that you're in a flat. But like, you'd have to just keep putting up this thing like, no, nah, no, nah, I live in a house. Oh, I pretended to go downstairs or something. But the only time I go downstairs is when I'm leaving my house. Like there's no actual downstairs. So I remember like, yeah, teachers in our school, I don't think we, they were taught at their time of training, they were taught like not to ask like stuff like the breakfast thing. Because for me, luckily, I obviously had breakfast, but I can only imagine how much tougher it is on the people that at least I had, I had like seen like grow up alongside me. Um, because as I said, like a lot of them were refugees. And it was just like, can you imagine how tough it was? And then oh, there's no mitigating circumstances, as you mentioned. And that at uni, when I f- first found out about it, I thought it was a cop out because I didn't understand what it was. And I was like, nah, I'm not stopping. Yeah, I'm not going to take mitigating circumstances if something happened. I'm just going to continue with whatever. In hindsight, yeah, I'm just like, I was too uneducated on that matter. Whereas I'm like, raw, like it could have actually made a difference. But that's just like one of those things like mitigating circumstances don't exist, at least as far as I'm aware until you get to uni unless you you know like for example um i know about a student who had like you know social anxiety and then he got sectioned so that means he ended up in hospital because his anxiety was so bad and he couldn't take his gcse's he went missing from home so he didn't want to be in touch with his family so he went missing for a bit during revision time that's like obviously if in hospital like we have to mention that to the examination board when it's time to do the exams but that's, that's like exceptional. Otherwise, the education system expects you to do your best. And that's not necessarily fair because your best. I, I think, for example, if somebody's a refugee student, the other thing is the language barrier. Like we talked about accent way before in the program. Kids will find, and you know, I love kids, obviously, but kids are shit, okay? <laughs> and, and kids will find the easiest thing to pick on you about, whether that's how you dress, if you have acne, your height, all of that. It's kind of hard to see it happen in front of me because I'm like, you guys, that, that stuff doesn't matter. But it is quite toxic that way. If you're a refugee student, you definitely have an accent and it's different and you'll find it hard because people who don't have the accent will pick on you. And there's also the whole thing about like cultural integration that I don't think that gets talked about enough. So for example, like I just like in in South Asian culture, or at least in my family, like we're all loud talkers, right? So we all yell at each other. That's just how we talk. And if you're in, say, a classroom with like a white teacher and everybody's used to kind of speaking like, oh, hello, good morning. How is everyone doing today? And you sit down and you're like, miss, miss, where's my bag, miss? You're not doing it because you're aggressive or because you're loud. But then we haven't you know, we've not talked about this enough, whether that's in education, in teacher training. Nobody said, hey, that kid is from a culture where people just talk to each other slightly loud. and There's nothing wrong with that. But then that kid's going to get ostracized. They're going to get told off. They're going to get suspended if they keep doing it. And they don't understand what's going on. Yeah, oh, I could talk about this for days, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's not like there is no level playing field. So in those circumstances, if a refugee student manages to get a C, I see that as a massive, that's, that's progress because they went from not knowing a language to getting a C for me in English, at least, because I teach English. Whereas, you know, let's say a Russell Group Uni is going to look at that and be like, hmm, you got a C. I don't know if I want to take that kid. But if you think of all the things they went through to get the C, you should take the kid, like take them because they're you know, determined and they're going to do well. Like one of the things about like, the refugees or that from my experience i'm just going to say that so i'll only touch on it lightly in this episode basically because they'll be kind of usually just they'll kind of group up with the people with similar backgrounds pretty much and because i said our school was very clicky so it already was very tough to integrate for them so as a result the only other people that know is those people and those people may be influenced by other people with 
I guess, anger and hatred towards the system that has fucked them from the beginning. So as a result, all of their, a lot of their life is turns into this vengeance thing because they may have had family members killed in front of them. You don't know like how bad it could have been. Like all they may have is like a single picture of a thing. And I know you see this in movies and stuff, but this is like literally real life. But a lot of people wouldn't experience it because they kind of get chucked into the same areas when they when they arrive and they get the access to be you know like living in this country for their own safety. And not a lot, not everyone gets that chance as well because of how it all works. So when you think about it, like a lot of them have way less prospects as a result just because of all the fuckery that happened. But as I like to say, it's a result of the system itself because the system is essentially warring in their countries. Their family ends up getting killed off. It becomes unsafe for them. They move here, get thrown straight into that same bubble where people like them have already been. What happens is their anger and if it's already pointed towards the system, it may lead to an extremist attack. It may lead to people you see going to join ISIS, um, going to you know do perform extremist attacks um, across London and so on. Because that's all they know is that vengeance that they have to get. This is the system that fucked them and now they're here and it's fucking them still. What can I do? Get back at them. There's certain people that have made it and well, by made it, I mean done it even, I'd say better than me. Like, And that's amazing because I remember when I was at Warwick, um, I think it was in my second year, when I was walking to campus, I saw someone from my school who I knew was like a refugee and made it. Had got like decent grades, managed to pull it around with like pretty much no English speaking. And they made it at Warwick. And then we met, like we never spoke at school. As I said, it was very clicky. So like, and I had no one, basically, I knew no one from school at Warwick. So it made my life very easy to, you know, just integrate. But when I met this person, I guess like we acknowledged that we were there. And then one time we just stopped and kind of just started, you know, like introduced each other, spoke to each other. And it was like, oh, cool. Yeah, it wasn't like anything. You know, like they're a nice person. It's just sadly from everything they've been through, they just ended up in a shit environment to grow up in. But luckily they, they made it. And big, big props to them. Not luckily, like big props to them for doing that. And like for them to make it is so much more of a struggle. And I can't imagine how much more shit it must be on a day-to-day basis for them. Yeah. And I think like that's probably one of the things I have to thank teaching for because before I got into teaching, you know, for me, like not going to Oxbridge felt like a big deal. Not landing, a, I don't know, a, a big corporate job felt like a big deal. It's Oxbridge. It's Oxbridge. Go with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll, 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 we say that to us. Yeah. But then when I like when I teach the kids that I interact with, you realize that like we really have it good. All of us have it pretty good. And I'm not saying that the people who aim for Oxbridge, um, there's anything wrong with them. I don't know if you guys know, but there's like a couple of years ago, there was a school in Pakistan where the Taliban um, killed like 140 students. There was a huge like school shooting. One of the boys from the shooting was injured and he played dead so that they'd leave him alone. He got his injuries fixed in the UK and he's going to go to Oxford this year. So, you know, for someone like that, I'm like, of course, like, please go to Oxford. Like, great. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's amazing what people can do. And it's amazing that people, you know, like, for example, like Malala, they get to kind of have that journey. But at the same time, like, we can all just be mindful that we have it good. That's that's all I'm saying. Like, when it comes to... Uh, <laughs> I really did enjoy Hamish's episode where he talked about, like, people who say they've made it or people who say, like, the struggle kind of thing. And I'm like, some of us really don't know how bad, like, struggle can be. If you lived in a stable home environment all your life, and then if you went to uni and you moved on to a job, that's that's amazing. And if you're ever looking at someone else's journey and telling yourself, oh, I'm not as good because I didn't do this, I didn't do that. Just kind of remind yourself that like life is good for the most part. If you're not suffering from trauma, if you're not, you know, if you don't have PTSD, if you're not like trying to navigate toxic family situations, you have it, you have it good. And just, you know, practice gratitude that way. I'm not saying like, other people's struggles don't matter. Some struggles are harder than others. Yeah, so that's why I always like to say, like, I'm very lucky to have made it here, given that, given if you look at the statistics, not a lot of people get the chance. Like, it's obviously I'm still living in this scenario, but I'm a lot better off. I can ensure that we don't go homeless, for example. Whereas four years ago, um, I was still thinking like, shit, I could go home and we could be homeless in a few months. And I'm so grateful for that. Like, because obviously I just happened to be the one, one of the people that actually got, to get ahead and just stuck to it but the refugees that's why I always like I know people don't like it when I do it I'm just like but I always mention it like shut up man you don't know about struggle I'm like I'll, I'll still do it just because I feel like if I'm here and if I don't voice all this wrong shit being said then I'm just like failing like I have to like say something like I may not represent all of them but I represent 
I feel like I represent enough of them. Not, not as a like a proper representative, but I feel like I can at least voice something on their behalf that a lot of people will never get to say because they'll never get the opportunity and they may not be comfortable with also saying it. But I can say from like my first hand experience with dealing with some of these cases, like, and I, when, I, when I mean dealing, I mean like being around it. I don't mean like, you know, being like a therapist or anything. I mean like seeing it, I'm just like, nah, if you're going to say some bullshit, I'm going to be the first one there to call you out on it. And you could take it as educational or you could take it as offensive. I'm not fussed either way. But I'm going to say it because at the end of the day, they're wrong. It may take them, if they may never understand, some may understand, some may be like, oh, wow, they didn't know that. But a lot of this is like, I can understand that a lot of people are not used to seeing it because not a lot of people make it and they get to speak about it. Like, it's not an option to like, it's not like something you want to glamorize. It's not like a fairy tale ending that happens, you know? And I can tell you like, in my head, like I was in, I had like fairy tale imaginations, like obviously to end up getting back. I'm like, I'll be like, by this point, I'll be in a big house. I would have made it, I would have gone clear. But obviously I still knew a bit of me knew that I'd have to live in this for a bit longer, but just with less of those impacts, if that makes sense. Just sadly, the mentality is that you get stuck. You just want to be stuck in the mentality for as long as possible whilst you try and put yourself through that to make it. Which I understand that a lot of people are going to say, oh, different struggles are different, you know, stuff. But in terms of what the, what a refugee would have been through, like I'm like, or like anyone, anyone in this kind of environment. And I'm saying I still have it better off than a lot of people. As I said, like I'm, as I said, I'm fortunate to be where I am. So like, that's why I'm like, I will say it. I know it's going to like piss people. I know it pisses people off on the regular when I have to say it. I'm glad that, as I said, that you understand this, like, or like you've at least experienced it and you're open to it. Like, cause like, that's like, that's like so like, you know, reassuring. It's like someone did take something away. I can explain something. I think the reason people get offended is when people might interpret it as, as an attack. Their pain no, maybe their pain doesn't mean enough. Because you know, oh, okay. all of us get all of us are in situations where stuff stresses us out. Mm-hmm. And what people don't like is if you turn around and said your stress isn't real stress. Mm-hmm. It's almost a little bit like I'm not going to say gaslighting, but it's like saying oh, yeah. your struggle is invalid and mm-hmm. pain is pain, right? The, there's no way we can sit around comparing the pain that different people go through. But like just quick story. But when um, last month, uh, like the month of August was this thing called South Asian Heritage Month, where a bunch of like South Asian media platforms tried to collect stories about what it means to be South Asian. Um, so I spoke to my mom about my granddad. I didn't know a lot about him, like growing up, what it was like. And my granddad's family uh, escaped from like Bangladesh to India. And he was one of nine siblings. So when he escaped to India, he got himself a job. And his job was to basically one by one, settle all eight siblings into India. No parents, no help. He didn't know anybody in a new city. He was working full time. And most days, like my mom said stuff like they would just drink a lot of water if there was nothing else to eat. Sometimes if somebody had like extra biscuits or dry food, that would keep them going. Eventually, when all nine siblings were in a brand new city, it was really rough because it was just like young people all trying to take care of each other with nobody looking out for them. And I remember like a few months ago, I I was moving house and I was stressed out about like paying rent and managing my bills. And I sat there listening to my mom say this and I was like, Wow, I what am I what am I stressing for? Like what it I'm worried that I have to pay a hundred quid more a month when my granddad like didn't have solid food for a week. And I'm not saying that my stress doesn't matter, but Yeah. You you have to real like some people their their real life stuff is and, and he was one of those people, like when it comes to glamorizing, when I was younger, my granddad was never somebody who would be like, Oh, you have it so good. You moved to the UK, good for you. He was always very much like, just do it, do whatever you need to do. My granddad actually taught me English. So I don't think I'd be an English teacher if it wasn't for him. And every time, like, obviously I've been in those situations where I was in India and we were considering if we would move out here. This must be the reason he was the first person to say, go for it. Go go to that new school, go to the middle of nowhere and settle down because I can do it. So you can definitely do it. So yeah, just perspective. The next time you're worried about money or just some type of kind of something that might seem quite stressful, maybe just remind yourself that it's not that bad and things will be okay. Yeah, so one thing I did want to add was that I'm not trying to always, you know, like people that maybe listen to the thing that I'm always trying to invalidate their pain or struggle. I, that's not what I'm trying to do. I'm just, I'm trying to educate. I just don't have the nicest way of putting it sometimes. 
like the only way I may do it is maybe do it in some blunt way, which may not work well with a lot of people, which I acknowledge. Don't worry, I acknowledge. And I try to learn from it, whether it, I put it into a joke or so, but I do acknowledge that, obviously. Um, I need to find what is it, a better art, way to articulate it than the way I usually do. <laughs> because I do understand that people will take it as an attack. But people who know me probably know at this point, it's not meant as a personal attack. It's meant to be like, shut up for a second, listen to this, and then make a comparison to it. Like, it's, I think it's just, it's just awareness. Like, because yeah. Maybe because of the, the school that I teach in, I mm-hmm. wouldn't have listened to it and taken it as an attack. Yeah. Because that's real. Like What you spoke about was real stuff straight up. And I'm not trying to say that like when you're wealthy, you have no issues, but when you're, when you have money, you have options. Yeah. And you know, if you, let's say you, if you get into an argument with your family, if you have enough money, maybe you could consider moving out, you know, maybe you could consider moving away. Like that's why I, I didn't enjoy like growing up in Glasgow for the two years. Cause I was like the only Brown person, lots of white people. And it was a lot of like, indirect bullying and making fun of me and making fun of where I'm from um but I had the option of saying I'm going to apply to Warwick and I'm going to move away and it made a huge difference a lot of people say that Warwick isn't like as diverse because they're from diverse neighborhoods but for me from the middle of Glasgow Warwick was incredible like meeting people like Sonali and people you know people from like kind of diverse backgrounds made a huge difference because just made me feel a bit more like confident about my own identity yeah, yeah, I was, I was in the same boat. I found it pretty, pretty diverse. One thing I did want to mention was, uh, so are you back in school now? School starts next week. Yeah, so at the time of this, you'll be back. Yeah. How are you with that? Because I know, like every other day, I feel like I'm seeing articles about, oh, they're they're only going to be students are only going to be in the half the time, or they're going to be in full time, and okay, no, they're going to postpone it. And it's is it all kind of a bit up in the air at the moment? Yeah from March everything's been up in the air everything like things can change in a week but I think one I just accepted that I'm just like if they change they change there's not much else I can do I want to go back I I, want to see the kids I teach um it'd be nice to just catch up like the kids I teach are hilarious and we have so much fun so I'm looking forward to that but if if it yeah if stuff changes I don't know if we go to into lockdown again because Birmingham's got quite a few cases and then we'll just have to see what happens then have they told you of any, I guess, social distancing measures? Because I don't know if you saw the news where um, I think Boris Johnson's cameraman or whatever fucked up. So basically, they were trying to show a classroom being socially distanced here. Yeah? And Boris Johnson was telling, you know, like trying to preach to them. And then the camera pans and you see everyone stuffed into the corner of the room. Yeah, I'm like, you're a fucking mug. You don't know. But that, 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 that's the truth of these politicians. I was just, I was just like... Was it live? It must have been live. Yeah, it's on Twitter as well. The clips everywhere, fam. You can't, you can't dodge it. Social media scrutiny is like one you can't dodge. I think our school is okay. Honestly, the wealthier your school is and the smaller your school is, it's easier to do all the social distancing stuff. We have about 900 kids. We're trying to, you know, so they're saying like different kids will come in at different points of the day. I'm probably going to lose weight because I have to walk to different classrooms to teach different year groups. And be on the move all the time. They've told us a bunch of stuff, you know, like we have to wear face shields and like we have to wash our hands all the time. But that's all they can do for now. Like you can't just say that kids will not go. Kids haven't gone to school for months. So I'm sure that's already had like enough of an impact. So one thing also to add is at least in the area you're teaching, um, presumably, like if you take away the education aspect or a way to get away from home, that's like a major yeah. impact on the child. And you can't, they need to go for their own good. Yeah. Like some of them probably know that, but a lot of others may not realize that, that if they're at home and they're not actually getting proper education or they're not getting the resources to access it, they may not have a computer, et cetera. Like that's a big impact. So like they, at the end of the day, they're going to need that education in those cases more than the people who can actually have, you know, the resources to connect virtually, which is a big thing. So you can't, I guess, deprive the child of the education. Like schools should always start. I feel like they should close the pubs down and all of that shit and just let the schools continue. But obviously, we'll see if the government decide to follow WHO guidelines. <laughs> because I feel like closing the pub, meaning that... You Are know, you like including something. restaurants in that? If they have to close restaurants so that kids go back to school, that's fine. Okay. Like, just go back to takeaway or whatever. Like, I feel like that's a way better trade-off than stopping a kid from getting education just for your social needs. That's just my opinion on that. I don't know. <laughs> I, I'm happy to hear other voices on that. But I feel like yeah. in our cases, we've already got our education. Do you know what I mean? The main like part of the degree and all of that. And we can do social, like we have the resources to do it virtually. We don't have to 
meet up, you know, for example, go to a pub, etc. Yeah, if you're saying you should close pubs and restaurants, yeah, fair enough. But I don't think you should just be yeah. like, oh yeah, close pubs, but don't close restaurants. Like, Yeah, yeah. So like, I mean, whatever thing. it takes to allow for schools to be the only thing that could, I guess, potentially spread COVID. And ideally it wouldn't, but we know that it's still going to spread. But ideally, at least have a reason that it's justifiable than businesses, just businesses alone. Yeah, I'd say two things. One, don't overwhelm the NHS. Ask somebody who knows a lot of doctors. They are they work like mad. Okay, like my dad did a full week's a week worth of work. Then he went in on Saturday. Then he did two shifts on Sunday. And yeah, I'm just like these guys are. They're trying their best, but don't make it any worse for them. And yeah, keep schools running because we don't realize what a gap it could have. And, you know, what differences it makes for some of these kids. So, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So now we're approaching the end of the episode. So we're going to start off with our final question. The first is what is one word or phrase you would use to describe yourself? Motivated. Have you found yourself less motivated during COVID and like yeah. lockdown and all that? I always want to have something that I'm like interested in or I'm working towards. For me, I, for a long time, I think I obsessed about like results, like what something looks like, what success looks like. But really, as long as you're motivated to just, you know, be a decent person and do something useful, uh, success looks different for different people. I don't even believe that yet. I'm just trying to teach myself <laughs> so I can, I can believe it. But yeah. Uh, second question. So this is a, this is quite a harsh question we have in here. Uh, one, um, yeah, not sure how I feel about it, but you, this is one you, uh, <laughs> you wanted to answer. And this is a, uh, how have you broken someone's heart in the past? I know. I, I, I heard that no one's picked this before. Because I've moved around a lot, I've been in a lot of situations where I got really close to people and then suddenly I had to go. And when I was younger, I didn't really know how to navigate that. Um, so when I was like 16, 17 years old, uh, there was somebody from my school in India that I really got on with. And, it, you know, it, it might be weird to be like, yeah, teenagers fall in love. But I think we did. And it was really nice. Um, but then I had to leave. I had to go to Glasgow. I had two options. One, I was going to try and do some kind of long distance thing. But I put myself first because I knew that the move was going to be quite intense. And I just wanted to focus on settling in. So I basically said to the other person, like, no, I can't do anything. Sorry. I don't want to be in a relationship. I just want to focus on settling in. And they, they completely understood it. I, it wasn't like an uncomfortable situation. But it was just really sad. Do you, uh, have you spoken to him since? Yeah. Yeah. We're actually like on speaking terms. We're, okay, cool, cool. But it's always something that we'll, you know, be a bit kind of sad about. Yeah. yeah. And um, the final question is, what has been your most memorable third wheeling experience, whether it's someone third wheeling you or you third wheeling somebody else? <laughs> I mean, I think Sonali talked about like third wheeling me and my boyfriend. So that's covered. <laughs> <laughs> um, but if you speak to him, he will honestly tell you that he third wheels me and Sonali. Uh, which is cool. <laughs> um, yeah, so when I was in on my year abroad in Canada, Canada finishes earlier than the UK in terms of uni. So I was off for a lot longer in the summer and everybody was making travel plans. So I was like, okay, where are we going to go? Uh, a bunch of people decided that they wanted to do like a, you know, like 10 cities and a massive trip. And I didn't think I wanted to kind of travel for that long just for money reasons like it's quite expensive so i one of my housemates who is a girl said we're just going to do like five cities and we'll keep it quite small it'll be you and me and i'm like great cool i'm happy to do that and then there was a guy that she was like oh he doesn't have anyone else to travel with so can he come with us oh like, yeah that's fine really didn't think anything of it but the more we kept traveling the more they were like into each other and i can tell and it was really <laughs> awkward because we booked all of our accommodation together so you know we'd be in a, a bunk bed situation where there's three bunk beds but the two of them are spooning and then I'm, I'm on a different bunk bed just like oh my god I don't want to be here it got to that stage where like we're in San Francisco and it was a hotel room with two beds so the, the two of them were in one bed <laughs> and I was in the other one and I was just like oh I don't want to be here <laughs> in the beginning honestly they would ask me if I wanted to join I don't think they meant like sexually they were just like hey we're all gonna watch Made in Chelsea together do you want to join and I was like no I'm traveling like, I don't want to watch Men in Chelsea. Uh, no offense to anyone who likes Men in Chelsea. <laughs> so, yeah, that was it, really. Like, I, we were in LA, and they actually finally got together in a club. And I was like, right, this is my time to book my ticket and go straight back to the UK. You guys go to Vegas and, you know, like, sex it out. <laughs> Get it out of your systems. Because you, you, when you're around two people who are into each other, you can feel the energy. Mm, yeah. <laughs> so. 
Yeah, for sure. Cool. Awesome. And yeah, any people at all you'd like to nominate to come on the podcast? Yeah, I have like three people I want to say. So I want to nominate this girl called Preeti, who runs a podcast herself called It's Preeti Personal. I think she'd be great. She just talks about a lot of South Asian stuff. And She's on tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, nice. oh, okay. yeah. well, that's great. I'm so glad. Yeah. Amazing. Steph from Warwick in my year. Uh, she runs a platform called Asians in Britain. Oh yeah, she she was called out by the last uh, guest. Let me know. Hey, third 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 one. Lucky oh, third time lucky. Third person that I was thinking of is a girl called Oslem who went to uni with us. Um, she does like poetry and she lives in London. She did politics, so she'd be great. Oh, that's already two amazing. Okay. Uh, that, that yeah, that the third name doesn't ring a bell, so. Cool. Yeah. Um, if I can, because the two have been taken, then I want to nominate somebody called Joelle, who also does. Like, yeah, more the better. More the better for us. Yeah, <laughs> podcast, and she's amazing. And she also runs her own page. I think she's like a confidence coach. She helps women of color. So, yeah. Oh my God, I can't believe that. Awesome. <laughs> I was there thinking I've picked really good people, which I have because they <laughs> I mean, you have, yeah. That's going to be really exciting. No, you guys are going to have such a good session with uh, Priti. I think you're going to discuss like podcasting stuff, which would be good. I'm starting yeah, on my to. own, so it would be good to have you guys on someday. That'd be really great. Oh, really? What are you, what's it going to be on about? Me and a friend who are both like teachers are just trying to talk about like navigating careers when you're ethnic minority people and what that's like. So we're hoping to speak to other people from ethnic minority backgrounds about how much yeah, sure. small talk and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, sounds good. Let's let us know. We'll uh, share it and all that kind of stuff. Cool. Thank you. And the final bit is a shout out. So you could, I guess, promote also wherever you'd like. Do you have anything in mind? Yeah, just want to promote like mental health stuff in general. Like come when it's September, a lot of people will be either going to uni or starting back at school again. So just be aware of how that's going to affect your mental health and speak to someone you trust and just you know it's all good just be open about it shouldn't be a stigma that's it Aaron yourself okay let's see this episode is going to be released in <laughs> how long in a couple of weeks so I think okay let's see I'm gonna say I have written something on my blog about starting <laughs> uni maybe hopefully you'll find out when you're listening to this if there's a link in the description <laughs> under my shout out then I've written something so hopefully I have um, this has failed like three out of five times that he's done yeah, this. Yeah, so. yeah. But, uh, <laughs> it'll cool. happen this time. It'll yeah, happen. it'll happen. I might. Yeah, yeah. So go go check out my blog and hopefully, if there are still uh, people listening here that are like freshers at uni or Warwick, especially, yeah, go go check that out. Maybe I've. To be honest, I'm probably just saying writing exactly what I said in this. So if you want to save it or something, I don't know. Yeah, go check that out. Yeah, I'm going to shout out my trip advisor because it's recently been getting um, a lot of hilarious traction amongst friends. So, and I know a bunch of other people that at least see the reviews. So, I was going to shout out my trip advisor. I should be hopefully trying more places in London safely. So, I'll be leaving my honest review and I'll put I'll put some jokes in there, you know, for everyone. So, if you want to go go back to following that, it's active again. If you're going to Warwick as a new student, there's a lot of places already reviewed for you, so take your pick. 11 out of 10 recommends that trip advisor. <laughs> not not for the opinions, but more just for the comedy. <laughs> so yeah, there you go. Um, you got first hand, first hand. I don't know what you call it, like review of my yeah, yeah. advisor. <laughs> so yeah, go check that out. And other than that, check out our socials as always. Check out Anu's socials. And yeah, cheers for being a great guest. Thank you for having me. I had a great time. Yeah, nice meeting you as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. And yeah, everyone, have a good day. See you all in a bit. Yeah, speak Bye. next week. Bye.